I, I do think that those skills that I learned from my illness, but also from having been in hospitality school, where you're learning about putting others before yourself, about patience, about being a good listener, about being a good human, those all helped me to get through those, those really difficult times. Hello and welcome to Proud to Be You, the official alumni podcast of Boston University. My name's Jeff Murphy, I'm your host, and I am so thankful that you're tuning in. My guest today is Hannah Olson, a School of Hospitality alum from the class of 2017. Hannah shared her story with me about how as an undergrad, a chronic illness threw a monkey wrench into her career plans. But those challenges inspired her to blaze a new path as a successful tech entrepreneur and workplace disability advocate. Shortly after recording our interview, Hannah was recognized by Forbes on their annual 30 under 30 list alongside some truly impressive professionals. Proud to Be You showcases the journeys of some of Boston University's most interesting and accomplished alumni. Inspiring grads share the highs, the lows, and the challenges they've overcome along the way from calm out to innovative careers. No matter where your path takes you, be proud to be you. I remember you telling me you grew up in Massachusetts, right? I did. I did. I grew up uh, just outside of Cape Cod. Right. And so you knew about BU all along. When you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? I'd say a doctor or a teacher. Okay. I clearly didn't end up on that path, but. So how did you end up at BU? You know, interesting story. I actually went to or finished high school abroad in, in Mexico. And so I didn't have the same college search experience as most people have when you're in high school and getting to tour colleges. So BU is actually one of two schools that I actually ended up touring. So I ended up choosing BU because I met the Dean of the hospitality school on my tour and he ended up giving us a personal tour and he convinced me that I'd, I'd find a home there. And here I am many years later as an alumni now. So you meet this person who convinces you that hospitality is an interesting path for you. What, when you got to be you those first few days, were you already contemplating careers in hospitality and what you were going to do with that degree or how, how, where were you, what, what was your thinking at that time? Yeah. You know, I didn't really quite know what I was going to do with, with the degree, but I had been living in Mexico and I was living in a tourist town, Puerto Vallarta on the West coast. And so I was very exposed to hospitality and, and the industry. Most of my classmates, parents were hotel owners, restaurant owners. And so, uh, you know, I had, it's really what I knew. And, and I didn't know that you could make a career out of that, or it was something you could study in school until I started uh, my, my college tours and ended up finding BU. And so, no, I, I really didn't know what I was going to do with it. I just knew I liked people. I liked talking. And I felt like it was a nice mix between these kind of hard skills and soft skills where you get the business school aspect, but also the human touch. So that's sure. what really attracted me in the beginning. So tell me a little bit more about your experience at BU. Like when you got here, where were you living? Uh, in your first year, I actually don't really know much about shop programs. Were you taking a lot of hospitality specific classes or were they just a lot of sort of prerequisites that you needed to do? So I was living on West Campus, which isn't too far from the hospitality school. So very nice short walk instead of having to, to trek down Calm Ave in the middle of the winter. I can say that wasn't wasn't too much fun. My, my first year, I, I took a, a range of classes. I'd say we took those core hospitality classes, such as leadership and these kinds of things. Um, but at the same time, also filling up those prerequisites. My background was, was quite unique in that I was an American coming from Mexico. And so I, I did have to take things like extra Spanish or extra English classes as well, just to, to kind of meet the minimum requirements. So it was a bit of balancing, took a lot of math at BU, which I was not expecting. Um, I, I still find myself using a lot of those math things, luckily, but um, did, did take a lot of math while, while at BU. So did you, I'm curious to know if you, um, maintained your relationship with the person that you'd met in Mexico from Shaw. Um, were there people at Shaw that you connected with, professors that when you think back now really come to the forefront of your mind as, as people that had a real impact on you? Yeah, the dean of the hospitality school is still the current dean. And so I had the chance to see Dean Abnasia and a few of my former uh, professors actually this past May when I, I gave the 
convocation speech, essentially the, the commencement speech for the hospitality school. So it was really great getting to see some of those integral early figures in, in my VU career. Uh, Professor Lands has always been and always will be one of my favorite people uh, to date and got to see Professor Modi, a lot of the folks that I had actually since my freshman year at, at VU. So I have kept up a relationship with them. Uh, we're on a texting basis, LinkedIn basis, always trying to like each other's posts and support one another. But it's been really nice seeing that at a school with, I don't know, 17,000 kids. I don't even know what the, the current population is. But to have those kinds of continued relationships, I think, is something extremely unique in such a large school and environment. Were there things that you were doing outside of Shaw, like... You know, where were you hanging out? Were there student organizations you were a part of? Where would we have found you on campus if you weren't in class? Yeah, I think in high school, I was quite or, or pretty over-involved. I did every single club and sport that you could have done. And so by the time I got to BU, I was kind of burnt out, to be honest. And I was very much in the weeds of, of my academics and trying to keep up with the transition of going from Mexico, where I was in a pretty laid back school and very open education concept to now being in a university where folks from all over the world and just kind of the, that shift. And so I did a lot of studying, spent a lot of time uh, at the library and what's it called? The GSU. Yeah, I ate a lot of a lot of food there. I did take part in that competition at the the uh, burger place, whatever, it's, whatever that's <laughs> called in the GSU. I did not that's... win the competition. Yeah, I, I didn't win, but I did take part in that. Um, but yeah, I wasn't ultra involved outside of the Shaw sure. community. And I, I did okay. find myself trying to get as, as involved as possible just yeah. within the School of Hospitality. And I know one of the reasons why I was excited to have you on to tell your story, you had some really challenging health concerns that came up while you were a student. Was that your senior year, your junior year? And I'm, I'm just wondering if you ended up doing like any internships or anything like that, or did your health issues sort of really change the game? I did do internships. So mm. my first uh, being at Nantucket Island Resorts, which was pretty cool. I got to live on Nantucket for the summer and was working really in the hospitality industry. I also worked at the country club and doing a lot of the, the traditional kind of hospitality type roles. But yes, it was during my sophomore or junior year at BU, I, I actually fell quite ill. I went abroad to Australia and when I returned um, I had a case of mono that never quite went away, and it took me about a year and a half of testing and seeing a million different doctors until I, I received a diagnosis during my junior year of Lyme disease. Uh, so that was a pretty crazy experience because I was spent, you know, when you ask where I was on campus, I, I was on campus, but I actually was was often uh, at times over in, in the Fenway Circle area, kind of at the Boston Children's Hospital and those kinds of places. So that's where you honestly could have found me uh, during the, the latter half of, of my time at BU. Yeah. So, I, I you know, I, I've had friends who've had Lyme disease, but not in a chronic way. Can you tell me and our listeners a little bit more about what that was like for you? And how did you manage that illness with finishing school? Yeah, I'm crazy. <laughs> I, I'm surprised I was able to finish um, in general and also as quickly as I did. I, I did graduate in three years, um, which was was insane. I probably should have just elongated it and, and taken care of myself. But um, Lyme disease and it essentially is I was bit by a tick at some point. Typically, if you are able to catch Lyme disease within the first two weeks of that tick bite, you're able to treat it and you can generally live a, a pretty normal life. But in my case, it took me quite a long time to actually receive that diagnosis. And throughout that time, I was experiencing pretty intense symptoms. For me, largely mental related symptoms. So it dealt a lot with memory loss issues, confusion of where I was at times. And you had this 21 year old girl, right? Experiencing or in, in college and, and doing all the things that, you know, I'm able to memorize for a test, but I didn't even know sometimes where I was or why I was in that room to begin with. And so experienced a lot of pretty crazy symptoms while at BU. And it was while I was in Shaw that I, I received that diagnosis and was able to start my treatment. Um, and, and about a week after my graduation from Shaw was when I ended up getting a, a permanent IV placed in my arm, which is 
the the catalyst for my current career, but it all yeah. did start back at a back Well, at and shop. that's that's what I'm excited to dive into now. You walk across that stage, you've got your degree. What happens next? Do you already have something lined up or what are what are your thoughts about, you know, what kind of jobs are you looking for and how are you going about doing that? You know, it's funny you ask that because having done the convocation this year, I looked back a lot at my experience of, of graduating and reflected a lot on those feelings of graduating and like all my classmates being really excited for the future. But for me, that future felt quite bleak. I think I, I left that auditorium without an idea of what my future held and a, a lot of fear and confusion over, was I even going to be able to work? Was I going to be healthy? Was I going to be normal? And all of my classmates were off to new adventures in New York City and Los Angeles, and they all seemed to have an idea of what was next. And that was pretty daunting to be sitting in that room and and being so unsure of my future. And, and I'm very lucky to have landed where I, I did, but I remember just that fear of, of what is next and is the future going to be okay? Yeah. Um, so if you're going through graduation and you have no idea what's next, it's okay. I had no idea what I was going to do, uh, but here I am today. So it's all good if you're are confused on what's next after you leave BU. It doesn't surprise me to hear that you can think back and remember those feelings of fear and being overwhelmed and daunted. But I'm wondering if you can also think back to how you overcame that. What were the steps that you took? What were the things that you did to keep going? Yeah, I think having dealt with long-term illness, you know, I've I've been dealing with health issues since 2015. I've learned a lot of, of skills throughout that experience of, of battling an illness. I've learned things like time management, empathy. I've learned how to, to really take care of my body and prioritize my needs. I've learned how to listen to others and, and be very patient. And so all of these things that I was learning just by having to live and exist and, and survive and, and beat this illness, I feel like that translated very well into my future and, and to be able to take these challenges and, and handle them as gracefully as I could. Uh, I don't have a perfect recipe for success because my path was not linear. It was definitely a lot of zigzags, but um, I, I do think that those skills that I learned through my illness, but also through having been in hospitality school where you're learning about putting others before yourself, about patience, about being a good listener, about being a good human, those all helped me to get through those, those really difficult times. This episode is brought to you by BU Connects, Boston University's exclusive online platform for alumni and student networking, mentoring, and more. Explore the profiles of nearly 30,000 Terriers and see how they're willing to help. Join groups to network with members who share your city, industry, or interests. Share advice or mentorship with students in need. Promote your business in the alumni business directory. Or find jobs posted by and for the BU community. Activate your free profile today at buconnects.com. And I, I know from chatting with you earlier that you had said that, you know, once you got out of BU, it was really challenging to find an employer that where you could balance your, you know, concerns for your health with full-time employment, et cetera, et cetera. So what does that first job out of the university end up being? I and did it matched not up with like kind of what you wanted. <laughs> Sorry, I cut you off there, but. No, you're good. I did not go into hospitality. Uh, right. As I'm sure you can imagine, hospitality industry is typically pretty hands-on and, and on your feet, especially having worked in restaurants and hotels. It was something that I just didn't at the time think that my body was going to be able to handle. Um, but while at BU, I had taken a lot of marketing classes and so ended up starting my career in marketing. I moved down to Washington, D.C. in 2017, and I landed what I, I thought was a, a dream job as a 21-year-old, 22-year-old. Um, I felt like I had a consistent role. I got to be a part of something greater than myself. And so I was pretty excited to just be be being able to do something in general. I think that was the, the big sentiment there was just having something. Okay. So you're working in marketing and where does your, at that point, do you feel like you have a direction for your career, something that you're aspiring to, or are you just in the middle of trying to figure it out and applying to lots of jobs, et cetera, et cetera? You know, at the time I was hooked up to IV antibiotics for over eight hours a day, which you can imagine is is hard to balance with anything in life. But 
I can attest and assure you that it was very, very hard to balance with a, a full-time job. And so at the time I was really focused on the day in front of me and am I going to have time to administer my medication, get to work, make dinner, meet my nurse to help me bathe myself. Those kind of basic human things that I, I just needed to do just, just to survive. And so I wasn't quite thinking that this was going to start uh, you know, some very long career. I just was trying to get through Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and um, hope for the best. So not to sound dark, but, you know, it was, it was definitely a challenge back then. Yeah. And I know that you're doing well health-wise today. How long were you, you know, from being diagnosed in, I think you said 2017? 2015. 2015, I'm sorry. Yeah. How good. How long until you felt like you were back to health that would enable you to live the life that you wanted to yeah you're still dealing with it no yeah I'm, i've been great since late 2019 mm. um doing really well i've been in what you'd say quote unquote remission um from the the disease so i'm not experiencing symptoms currently i've been off of antibiotics since then but yeah it was a couple years of being on intense antibiotic treatment i gotta say it's it does a toll and a number on your body so I know that experience seems like it's really kind of changed the trajectory of your career and you went in a pretty different path from marketing and advertising, et cetera, into what you are doing now. I, I know that you had also, I think I saw um, you had a fellowship for social entrepreneurs at one point. Done a few, done a few of those kinds of things, um, gotten involved in a lot of different entrepreneurship organizations. But yeah, I, I did not expect to become an entrepreneur. This is definitely not something I, I ever saw for myself. I think I am someone who does crave structure in a way. And so having to just do things on your own and figure it all out wasn't necessarily um, what I had expected, but I had to figure out a way for myself to be able to survive and to be able to contribute in the workplace. And so I, I had found myself in a workplace that wasn't accepting of my IV and, and my illness. And I had kind of started seeking out resources and support. And I kept hearing that same sentiment of, I want to work and I'm able to work, but I'm looking for an employer who cares and who can accept me and accommodate me. And it was that that really started my entrepreneurship journey where I started to have to find a better way because without it, I didn't know how I was going to continue pursuing my career. And so I really fell into this. Looking back, I was kind of entrepreneurial in my life with lemonade stands and selling black pearl jewelry on the street. Did a lot of kind of crazy things like that, but it wasn't necessarily what I had ever seen as, as my full-time gig. So tell us a little bit more. I, I know that you and a co-founder launched a, a venture called Chronically Capable. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about how that came to be and then just, you know, the point of the organization. Yeah. So Chronically Capable was our first business, which we started back in 2018 um, and launched in, in late 2019. And initially we had, we had set out to help connect folks with chronic illnesses and disabilities like myself to employers who could accommodate and were actively seeking to build a more diverse and inclusive workplace. And so we launched that pre-pandemic, which I got to say at the beginning was very, very difficult because no one was really thinking about illness and work. Talking about any type of illness in within the workplace was very taboo and something that you often hid because you didn't want your employer to see you as weak. And so it was very, very hard in the early days to get that traction and um, attention to the the problem that we were solving. But fast forward, I think the pandemic greatly shifted how we talk about illness and work and how we think about inclusion and flexibility and work-life balance, all of these kinds of things. And so as we've now moved into our second business, uh, it's been just really interesting seeing all of the the change and in, in just human humans as well. I'm curious to know, because we have so many people who listen to this show who are interested in entrepreneurship. You launched one organization in 2018 and have almost already, you know, launched another one with Disclow. Um, how, how the timeline on that seems really pretty wild that you're able to get these startups up and running in such a, to me, seems like a short period of time. Uh, are you just as an entrepreneur living and breathing this, it's really taking up, you know, 110% of your time or how does that all go down for you? 
I like to try to build balance where I can. It's not always perfect, but I think having run two businesses now, you have to also take time for yourself. And having gone through such a long-term illness, I think I'm enjoying all the the moments, like getting to see your friends and getting to go outside and run around and not worry about sweating or ripping your IV out. Um, and so I try to, to make time for for those things where possible. But yeah, it's been it's been a crazy timeline. I think I've been going nonstop since 2018, which uh, the pandemic definitely forced me to slow down a little bit more and really start to repri- uh, reprioritize, as I'm sure many people experienced. But yeah, it's been it's been a busy few years, to say the least. So can you tell, I think you launched Disclo in 2021, if I have my facts straight. Can you tell us a little bit, mo- a little bit more about that project? Yeah. So we actually ended up launching it, I believe, yeah, it's been, been about a year. So it's been in 2022. We started it in 2021 announced it publicly in 2022. We moved from the recruiting space into the HR space, and we now run a company called Disclo, short for disclosure. And we help people with chronic illnesses and disabilities like myself uh, to ask for accommodations at work. So those could be things like a physical adjustment, all the way to schedule changes and extended time, those kinds of things. And we took a very antiquated paperwork process and modernized it and made it digital and, and very easy to to complete. So very much like a TurboTax experience, but for accommodations in the workplace. So now you've launched these two social ventures that are making a difference to people. Um, I'm curious to know if you you know can look back and have an idea of the number of people you've had a positive impact on with both Chronically Capable and now Disclo. Wow. I should count. I, it's definitely over a hundred thousand people that we've we've touched uh, thus far, which is is pretty awesome. Incredible. Considering we're still to this day a team of less than ten. Right. What an accomplishment. Thank you. So, at what point, you know, obviously you've had this impact on hundreds of thousands of people. At what point do you start thinking about yourself as like professionally an advocate? Um, was it where in your own illness journey did you start to have these ideas about? I want to do this to help other people. I think advocacy at its core is the ability to speak up for a larger group and to be able to advocate for yourself and and your needs really, and to be able to speak about that. And so I think when I started speaking on Capitol Hill and really getting out there and meeting folks like Joe Kennedy and just starting to really talk about my experience and and talk about other people when I would share my experience. That's when I started to to see that shift of, hey, this is about a lot more than just me. Hannah is one story. There are millions and millions of people out there with similar experiences and, and unique experiences. And I think when I realized that I could people are listening to me. That's when I, I started to really um, use my voice more and, and realize that I could use it for, for a greater good. Yeah. So when you think about your accomplishments post BU and you think back to that time, and I know that you did a lot of this, uh, this past May, but when you reflect back on your experience here, here at BU and who you were then, would that person be surprised to see what you've gone on to do and all the, the ways that you've been able to impact people? For sure. I, I would be surprised just to know that I'm working and thriving and not hooked up to an IV. I think that that felt like my future for so long and it, yeah. it felt, uh, you know, that I was going to be in this, this forever. And so I think I'm absolutely surprised. I continue to surprise myself, but I also continue to learn. I think I was very naive back in, in 2017 and I've learned so much and, and continued to look back at my time at PU and, and felt just an immense sense of gratitude for all that the school gave me, continues to give me. I always tell people today, keep, hold on to your BU community, hold on to your academic professors, advisors, all of those people, because those relationships have carried me. Um, and those people have been here every step of the way since I, I left. That's awesome. You've touched on this a couple of times, but one of the things I always want to know is knowing what you know now, um, you, you talked earlier for, you know, current students don't sweat so much about, you know, what you're studying and figuring out where you're going to go after that. You talked about sort of taking time. Uh, what are the other sort of pieces of, of advice that you know now that you wish you could share with the average BU student as they progress through their degree? It's okay 
<laughs> first and foremost, it's all going to be okay. I think we all have a lot of pressure on ourselves, especially when we're graduating and perhaps your parents or loved one has shelled out a lot of money to, to make you go to this school or, or to help you go through this school. And I think there's a lot of pressure that comes with that. And so reminding yourself that it's okay, I think is one thing, but it, you're right. I think not knowing that you don't have to have everything figured out is a huge one. I think when I was in that auditorium back in my graduation in 2017, everyone around me seemed to have everything figured out. And in reality, no one did. <laughs> it's just how people presented themselves and, and talked about themselves. And so know that everyone out there is also experiencing this confusion. Um, but I, I think really, again, digging deep for the skills that you've learned within whatever major or area of focus that you're in, I'm not pursuing a career in hospitality, but I take those skills that I've learned and I put them to use every single day. Things like time management, empathy, being a good listener, the things I mentioned before, those are all things I learned in hospitality school and then also through illness. And if that can make us be, if we can pull whatever skills I mentioned, I even use my math skills that I never would have expected from finance and accounting. I use it every single day. And so digging deep for those um, skills and, and really being able to harness them, I think is, is quite important. Well, that was some awesome advice. Thank you for sharing it. And speaking of advice, one of the things that we're doing on season three of Proud to Be You is actually asking our audience to chime in with their own questions to get their own advice. Uh, and so I've got a question here from Emma Cistellini, who is a recent graduate from the School of Public Health, class of 2022. And she's got a question she wants to ask you. Hi, I'm Emma Cistellini, and I'm a School of Public Health alum from 2022 and I'm proud to be BU. What is your most memorable job interview experience? Great question. Um, I'd say that for me, it's probably my second job out of college. So I had mentioned that that first role didn't land out to be so perfect, but my second job actually, uh, I ended up leaving the, the marketing agency that I was at and, and moved into a startup. And the person who interviewed me it was a guy named Kai. Kai was born and raised in Japan and had a family member who was blind and was always thinking about disability inclusion. He asked me, what do you need from me? How can I be a supportive boss to you? And it was a night and day experience having come from a pretty rough work experience and being so ill to have someone who was really looking out for me and, and looking out for my best interests. And it was in that job, job that we actually ended up starting our first business. And so my second job interview was really my last, uh, at least for the foreseeable future, uh, because I, I now end up, I, I now run two companies with Kai. So my former boss and interviewee is now my co-founder and he likes to tell everyone I'm his boss, but that's not true. So you're hearing it from me. I'm, I'm not his boss. So let's, you, you've touched on this a couple of times, but I, I must, I think it must have been a, just a surreal experience to in 2017 graduate from BU and then seven short years later, you're invited back to speak at commencement. Does that feel like early on in your career, any, as some sort of validation or, or help you to feel like you're on the right track? What did that feel like to have that, you know? I won't assume it was an honor for you, but it seems like it would have been. It was definitely an honor. I mean, it was it was a weird pinch me moment. I, I think I'm probably the youngest commencement speaker that Shaw's had thus far. And so it was definitely weird um, and, and super, super special. I, I think getting to go back and also be able to do that and sit next to two of my professors that I had multiple times throughout my, my time at BU was a really amazing experience to have Professor Lands like patting me on the back throughout the entire ceremony was was a, a really wow moment. But I think more importantly for me, what what excited me about that opportunity was the ability to get to speak to the class and the graduating class who I had always wanted uh, someone who was very relatable to hear from. I think at graduations we often have someone who's many years older than us and who've gone on to do all these wonderful things, and it's really great. But sometimes it's not relatable. So. I think that that was really special to me was getting to speak to the class who was really only a few years younger than me. I think yeah. that was hopefully a good experience, as good as experience for them as it was, was for me. So I'm curious, last question for me, what's next for Disclo? And then what's next for you? Where do you see this path taking you as you continue forward? 
Disclo is definitely in, in growth mode. We are a year and a half in right now. So just focused on growing this business, building out our, our client base and continuing to make an impact and in, in getting more folks disclosing at work, which I think is, is so important. In terms of what's next for me, I, I'm starting to transition into an interesting role where we were three people a year and a half ago, and now we're 10, about to be 11 and 12, 13, et cetera. So I'm, I'm starting to transition more into a people leadership role. I'm essentially HR and my name is Hannah Rose. So um, mm -hmm. it's not too hard to remember my, uh, my role, but it's been definitely an interesting transition. So we'll see how this all goes, but I'm starting to grow a team. And with that comes all the fun challenges and changes. Uh, but I am just so excited to be getting to do something that matters and, and matters not only to me, but to so many people out there. It's, it's, I truly feel like I have the best job in the world. And I guess I do have one last question for you. I'm just thinking about for, for our listeners that are really interested in disability advocacy, um, where, where do you turn to, for inspiration in this area and to be informed and, you know, knowledgeable about best practices and, and all of those things. Do you have it, resources to, to share or potentially even websites that, you know, you uh, might <laughs> oversee yourself? Yeah. Um, the Job Accommodation Network is one of my favorite resources. It's a free resource that's run by the U.S. Department of Labor. So it's a government resource. They have every single thing you need to know about disability inclusion in the workplace. It's one of my all-time favorite places to learn Disclo, of course, I've got to have got to do a self plug because we are definitely putting a lot of content out. Um, but I think most importantly, I try to fill my feeds with content that is diverse and that's continuing to educate me. If I put a bunch of people without disabilities on my LinkedIn feed, I wouldn't be learning and I wouldn't be learning about the community that we support. So I, I think constantly following people, people like Keely Cat Wells and I think there's just, you know, you, you just have to get out there and, and put in the work yourself as well. So I spend at least, I'd say at least 30 to 45 minutes a day just reading about news in my space, learning from other advocates and uh, founders in my space. So it's all just what you put your put, what you put in front of you. Yeah. Well, Hannah, thanks so much. It was really great to hear more about you and get to know you a little bit. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me. It was great to be here. My thanks again to Hannah for joining me and congratulations again to her one more time for making the Forbes 30 under 30. If you're interested in hearing more about Hannah and her company Disclo, I encourage you to follow her on LinkedIn where she shares some really interesting advice about the future of work. If you heard anything today that makes you proud to be you, I hope you'll join me in donating to the cause at BU that means the most to you at bu.edu slash give. Thanks for listening to Proud to Be You. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and review our podcast on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your episodes. The Proud to Be You podcast is produced by Boston University and our partners, Five Tool Productions, a BU alumni-owned, Boston-based company specializing in video production, live streaming, and content marketing. Our theme from artist.io is Think About Lights by Ben Fox. All additional media in this episode has been shared by our guest. To learn more about Proud to Be You, visit bu.edu slash proud to be you.